where it's time for our next fantastic virtual track speaker. Welcome along to Erica Vitakanen. Hi, Erica, how are you? Hello, everyone. I'm good. <laughs> good, good, good. And you're here. This is this is a term that's close to my heart because there are so many interpretations of what that wonderful three letter term MVP stands for. And I believe you're here to talk to us about that. Yeah, that is true. Fantastic. I, I also believe that you started your first company when you were only five years old. It says <laughs> <Yeah>. here. <laughs> Trying to sell drawings to your neighbors. Yeah. Not successful? Was not so successful back at the time. No, but then you went on 26 years later to set up your own business, e-commerce, art store, and managed to sell some new drawings. So, you know, that teaches you something about persistence, I think, there. Erica. Yeah, <laughs> I believe so, too. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, welcome along, Erica, and over to you to give us that talk about uh, yes. the most misused MVP and how to get it right. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the session. I hope you can see my screen now. So as said, my name is Erika Vitikainen and I have a wide experience in change management and agile models from different domains and organizations. And as introduced uh, just recently, I also run my own side business in arts. Right now, as said, I work for TaskMill, which is a people-focused practical change management company. Our services cover like agile strategy and training, and we also offer a very, very senior agile specialist uh, to roles in your company. Many of my colleagues are at the event today, they wear these black task mill hoodies. So if you want to chat more, or if you simply want this nice task mill reflector, you can say hi to our gang. So why I chose to talk about MVP, the minimum viable product today? It is simply because I feel it's one of the most important concepts in agile frameworks and actually even one with which you can measure the stage of agility in the organization. But it's also the most misunderstood concept. Sometimes it has gone so far from the original meaning that people even choke about the MVP on the corridor or they use it as a curse word. Personally, based on my experiences, I feel that there is a few main reasons to this. First of all, it might be that the organization has decided to apply agile frameworks, but they were not really able to go so far to make the hard decisions. For example, when the targets of the many are not aligned and they all come to the product development or management table, it might be really tempting to promise some, everyone with some kind of MVP instead of cutting out 80% of this idea flow. Secondly, it might be that we talk about continuous development and continuous improvement and such concepts, but in real life, everybody knows that the product development pipeline is fixed for months from now. So this ends up, up with the situation where you have to stuff in all your hypotheses and wishes in the start in order to get something out. This is, of course, a very expensive way to validate and test ideas in the markets. Thirdly, we often talk that it's like you have this possibility and opportunity to fail and share your learnings and so on. But quite often, I'm not sure if it's like really so. So it might be that the teams don't really have the time or courage to fail. Maybe in bigger organization, it's more about the courage. And in smaller ones, it might also be because of the funding situations. So quite, quite traditionally, the investors would wait for results and go to market and actual products instead of like pivoting and rethinking and learning. So if we want to understand then how to fix your MVP, we might want to go back to the very root, roots of Agile frameworks 
and talk a little bit about empiricism and the definition of the MVP itself. So empiricism, it is really closely related to the idea of agile frameworks. And it's about seeing, hearing, sensing, and observing. So the what we know part about uh, the real life and the world is based on this. Then as comparison, it is not so much about fluffy monster excels where you have forecasts and modeling for the next three years that we don't actually base on the real life. So if we talk about the empiricism in relation to MVP, it would be more empiricistic to think that if you have even, for example, a handful of customers that are already interested in what you have to offer, in comparison with you have tons of Excel sheets and calculations, we would value the first one more. Secondly, about the definition of the MVP itself. So we might want to talk about minimum viable product, but of course it can be a service or it can be an experience. Anyhow, it is the smallest possible solution for some kind of primary user's problem to gather real feedback and learn. We cannot stretch here enough to learning part. So quite often the MVP phase is already loaded with the monetary targets, but the real purpose in this agile framework and in empiricistic thinking is to learn. So as I said in the beginning, I think MVP is so central concept to understand the whole Agile framework that we can use this show me your MVP test to examine the stage of agility in any organization, if it's like hollow or real. So you can go with these four questions to any team and ask first. Can anyone in the team name who is the primary target customer and end user? And what is the problem that we are going to solve? And if this holds true, do they have only the very essentials to tackle this problem? Or have they loaded the MVP stage with a lot of stuff? Thirdly, even if these first two exist, is there a learning plan in place? So is there some kind of structured idea, what kind of things we are going to learn and how we are going to validate to actually get it done? And fourthly, is there time and cultural space around the team to actually react to what they will learn them? If they don't have this uh, possibility to say aloud, what is the result? or if they will not have the possibility to actually react to the results, then we are just fake learning. So this sounds so desperate. <laughs> so here is now a few tips that what you can actually try concretely. So first of all, if it's your gang making the decisions, you can do this yourself or if it's some kind of IT or business leadership team, you might want to discuss this practice. So go back to the past forecast, look at the sales forecast and the estimates in Excel and calculate them all together. And then consider, was it real after all? Quite often we learn that if we actually calculate together all the forecasts that were promised for the product development, we would have like sales and turn turnover of 10 times to the present actual situation. So when we start validating for real, the sum might be a bit more, a bit smaller, but it's maybe real. Secondly, this sounds obvious, but it often then still not happen. So we often end up discussing just the value and not time and value in relationship to each other. This is also very essential in any agile thinking. 
So we might end up in very like emotional quarrels and tricky situations when we just discuss the value part, because then something is always important to someone. And when we just discuss this and we prioritize, somebody gets hurt. So when we bring the time equation back to the picture and we ask, yeah, this is valuable, but how soon it will start producing any value, then we are on the tri right track. Related to the first points, but still stretching. It might be more uh, tempting to go back to the forecasts, but when we have some real proof and we start comparing it to each other, then it's much easier to prioritize all the ideas across the pipeline. Because when we discuss these forecasts and models, it is normally the one who is the most bold Excel analyst who will win the competition. Then also, um, people cannot argue or discuss something that they don't understand. And quite often when we actually look at any backlog or plan, it is full of these technical terms or this inside group slang that everyone cannot discuss. So when we start talking in kind of like real language, we increase inclusion and we also set the ideas to the same level. And, and, and this like example on the right one, you can compare this, uh, use the story of uh, on TV call, bring ID and provisioning data from Robbie to video share. And then imagine you come to the table and you try to prioritize or discuss this. As compared to, as a parent, I want to activate my mobile order on TV in just a few seconds to enjoy a movie night with my family. So when we discuss value and when we talk in real terms, we can include everyone and it's much easier to prioritize. Then you can also stretch the who part instead of just discussing the what. Especially when we start with the who part, then it's more easy to finally also decide on the what part. So quite often when we try to limit the MVP scope, we only discuss the features and feature possibilities and similar. But when we start like, okay, this service or this solution maybe has a lot of user groups, but who is the most important? Who has the most painful need to get this solution so that they can, for example, actually change to it uh, regardless of the change cost? Then we can uh, start with the primary part and then we can also scope the what part down more efficiently. Uh, finally, you might want to take a look at also your team or organizational structure. So if teams are very strongly arranged around the existing solutions, maybe some kind of systems or similar facilities, it is much more likely that we end up arguing, for example, the priorities of different systems or backlogs or similars. But when your people are actually arranged around the problem to be solved and not the solution, then it is much more likely that everybody agrees on what to prioritize first. And then in the end, <laughs> when you have done all of this and you look at the table and you want to try to ask yourself that can you cut once more? Is there something that you can still do in a bit more light white way to get even faster results, to learn even faster? A popular example uh, relates to this Microsoft Word program that we are probably all using. And the example comes from Jeff Sutherland, who is kind of like the father and one of the developers of the Scrum framework which is one of the most popular Agile frameworks. So simply looking at the Microsoft Word program and thinking about what is the part of the features that we actually use in our daily lives? And what are the rest of the features? 
Are they actually making the usage of the program better? Or are they actually like decreasing the value and standing on the way? And not to forget that somewhere there, there is also a development team that will host all of these features that nobody uses. So this relates to this kind of uh, 20 to 80 rule. So looking closer at any topic, we normally learn that roughly 20% of the things produce the 80% of the value. And the whole idea of this MVP cycle is to go out to some real customers to recognize those actual 20 things and then build them even better. So bring this a little bit back to our own lives. Uh, let's imagine that you are planning this long weekend with your loved one or your family member and you want to, you have put a lot of expectation to this car's rare time together maybe. So as we know maybe from any family summer holidays or similar, it is quite li likely that we we load uh, the time together with our expectations and finally end up arguing and causing actually even more stress than any value. So whether it comes to any product development or managing your own life or expectations, to stop once a while and really like to reflect what causes value to more leads to this that less is always more. So I want to thank you for your attention. This was kind of like the monologue part of my presentation, but I'm happy to have any conversation or comments. And as said, there is a lot of people from Task Mill uh, today at the event, so feel free to go and reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica. I'm hearing myself echoing there. Uh, as usual, if you've got any questions for Erica, start typing them now into chat and I'll start reading them uh, through. Uh, kick everyone off, though. Quick one from me again, Erica. Again, thank you ever so much. Again, all this stuff is wonderful because these are the kind of the pains we kind of go through, um, especially if we're in organizations which are new to Agile. And <clears throat> as you said right at the beginning, often there's a misinterpretation. You know, people are going very strongly into using Agile and reading books and seeing terms like MVP and et cetera, et cetera. And it's often misunderstood. And we want to get it right from the start so that we have a good foundation for building good products. Um, would you say MVP often it's seen as that, that first release, isn't it? You know, we want to build a product and the MVP is the first thing that customers see. But would you say it's smaller than that even? It, essentially what you're saying is it, it, it can be, an MVP can be used multiple times as you said, to get learning from different aspects of our product, not the single first view of our product, but we could say, well, we want to MVP a particular facet or feature of product. It doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be uh, sophisticated. It doesn't need to be finished. It needs to give us something that gets learning. Is that essentially what you see as an MVP? And we can therefore reuse that model many, many times for our products. Yeah. Definitely. And some people actually like to talk more about minimum viable experience. Yeah. And as a concrete example, for example, from my past that um, once we were in one team building this new consumer e-commerce platform and we were struggling a, l a lot with this um, part of uh, improving the whole end-to-end -end logistics from the store to the final end customer. Yeah. And uh, we were thinking like how to test this actually and what to do and how to learn. And then finally we realized in one chat together with the team that we can basically manually play out the whole planned um, e-commerce logistic flow the first time to learn if it actually works. That mm. let you be the mailman and let you do this part. And then we actually just have a bunch of customers and we learn. And just these very simple things, and you are much more confident to put in a lot of money to develop the actual solution. Yeah. So it's all about validation and learning. And as, as you stretched out, uh, MVP is maybe the one uh, known concept because it's so uh, clear and uh, so, like clearly structured. But these MVPs can happen in our life every day. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I've right, got questions coming in now. Uh, one from Maria here. How do you discuss reality with a CEO, a chief executive who lives with their dreams of growth and pushes these oversized MVPs? Yeah, well, of course, relates a bit to your relationship with the CEO, how, <laughs> how uh, roughly to start, so to say, but going back to my presentation. So I think because uh, CEO's job is to mostly care about the money. <laughs> so uh, the practice that I slightly introduced is um, if you really like go back to the past and ask the CEO to calculate together all of these forecasts and promises that were made in the past and look if there was actual result, then they will actually normally realize themselves that there is something wrong with the process that it is not delivering. And when people realize something themselves and it, it is not pushed back to them, mm. then it is more strongly normally also the realization. And then they are more open to ask like, okay, this is real. What to do next? Yeah. And I guess, you know, uh, we heard from like our, our, our keynote speaker earlier, you know, leadership is a really, I mean, CEO is part of that leadership suite, obviously. And there's a real cultural change we want to foster, isn't there, with so they understand these concepts. I'm guessing it's it's a more about creating a better relationship than bringing them close to the products, those kind of things to try and get them educated into the idea of learning early through fast experimentation and things like that. Yeah, and I think a very good side of this kind of process. So if you are able to involve the top management, even short time to actually like feel and sense the process and to see the actual feedback and see the customer reactions. Uh, this kind of agile process is normally such that people just naturally get inspired about yeah. it and they kind of like grow the belief. Yeah. So bringing them close to that process gives them there at that, the CEO, the education as well. Um, yeah. Another question here. This is a good one. You know, we're an established brand. Our customers expect high quality products from us um so how do we balance that you know uh, to launch new products at mvp or just try out with limited customers how would you deal with uh, organizations we've already got this very trusted brand and they're kind of fearful of of experimenting with their customers yeah that's a very valid question mm -hmm. because we always want to protect the brand of course and especially when it's about high quality to really stretch the quality but I think the answer is very simple. So you can, for example, like uh, gather a group of uh, some of your engaged users and really tell them this is a test and we want to improve your experience. And this is something new. And how do you feel about it? Uh, sometimes you might even want to offer a small reward or something mm -hmm. in participating to the test. Or if we talk about digital experiences, you can always offer the alternative to access the new and old one at the same time. But I kind of like think the answer comes down to very transparent and open communications in most cases. So normally yeah. people in the end, they end up valuing uh, the feeling that this brand still wants to develop and they want to hear my feedback and it's openly shared. Yeah, and I guess from a customer perspective as well, I mean, it's, it's possibly a bit of a myth that, you know, customers uh, see quality as, uh, you know, well-finished products. But what about customers that get involved, that are asked, do you like this rather than that? You know, that can we try something with you? Surely that is great uh, quality being built into our processes. You know, make that a power of the product that you are you involve your customers rather than seeing them as someone that we only only give them the very end finished product. I'm guessing it can be turned into a quality advantage for your customers as well, can't it? Yeah, definitely, because then you tell that you are listening and you actually... Yeah. Of course, it comes down a little bit to the brand engagement, how much the customer is willing to kind of like uh, test, mm. and elaborate and participate. So you need to choose kind of like the right way to do this based on kind of like how strong and loyal relationship you have with your customers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. There's no more questions in chat. 
Again, a fantastic uh, uh, talk from you again, Erica. So thank you very much, Erica, for your time today.